the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcome today, Dr. Alexia Soria, who is a board-certified fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in hand, wrist, and elbow. And we're really glad to have you here today. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. Today, we want to talk about some common hand, wrist, and finger injuries that we see in an orthopedic walk-in clinic. We'd like to discuss fingertip injuries, wrist sprains and distal radius fractures, phalangeal and metacarpal fractures, and... I'm sure we could devote an entire podcast to each of these conditions, but my goal for this series is to cover the basics on some common conditions that we see in an orthopedic walk-in clinic and hopefully help our listeners understand surgical versus non-surgical management. We see a lot of the wrist sprains and distal radius fractures, and I'm fairly confident that many of our listeners, if not all of our listeners, know how to manage common wrist sprains. But when you start talking about further workup of a sprain, if it's not improving, what are some oddball or not even oddball common injuries that might be missed as a sprain. A sprain is a big umbrella term, right? Mm -hmm. Where does it hurt? What was the mechanism? Low energy or even, you know, I think a lot of times we, um, or I I know I do, I I put the diagnosis of wrist sprain for ulnar sided wrist pain, you know, and that it would encompass any kind of a TFCC injury, ECU tendonitis. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, you know, one area of the wrist that's often injured, you know, but then you're also going to worry about a scapholunate um, injury um, that, uh, you know, could be a partial tear, could be a complete tear, things that may or may not show up on an initial x-ray um, with the classic uh, widening of the scapholunate interval, Terry Thomas sign or the signet ring sign with the flexing of the, of the scaphoid. The most, the biggest thing not to miss that I often see in these uh, kind of trauma films for the wrist are uh, as a scaphoid fracture, and you know, and looking looking carefully for any tenderness of the scaphoid. Um, getting a scaphoid view is really important, and I really include it in, in almost any wrist series that uh, is for trauma. You don't want to miss that, obviously. If it's if there's no fracture and it's not improving, then you really need to pinpoint where the pain is and uh, if it's deserving of you know, more, more specific of immobilization. So if it was a TFCC injury, do you need to put it in a Munster splint or does it need advanced imaging? Does it, does it need an MR arthrogram? If you're concerned enough to order an MRI and it's not obvious what the injury might be, you're reaching out to, to one of the hand surgeons is always helpful just to guide, make sure we're getting the imaging for the appropriate reason and getting the, the, the right sequences that we need. You know, do you need an arthrogram? Do you need it with and without contrast? Things like that. Yeah. And, and for our uh, listeners, you know, having someone follow up in two days to say, is this a fracture or not? And having to make another copay is, is no bueno. You, you really need to contact your doc if you don't know uh, and make sure that you have a plan before that person leaves or call them back. Having somebody come back in two or three days, is it a fracture or not? You know, I, I'm not saying an obvious problem that needs to be seen or fixed, but, you know, you really, you know, it's just not good medicine to do that, I don't think. Um, distal radius fractures. So non-displaced, non-angulated distal radius fractures, short arm cast and follow up in a few weeks. I know that's pretty cut and dry and, and there's a lot of variability, but would you agree with that? These obviously have a lot of nuances to them. The non-displaced, non-angulated fracture. Well, you know, is this somebody who fell today and came in and you can see the fracture line, it's non-displaced. Is there some dorsal comminution? Do you see some comminution in the Lester's tubercle? Does, does it look like it might dorsally angulate? You know, and, and I think it's very hard to, in the completely non-displaced fracture, sometimes they come back a week later and they're fairly significantly dorsally, dorsally angulated and, and some aren't and do quite well with just a, just a cock up wrist splint. So I think it can be, can be difficult to tell, but I think if you have any inclination that it was a fairly significant mechanism and there's some comminution there, then I, then I go for the sugar tong. I mean, you're never going to be wrong uh, putting somebody in a sugar tong for a week, getting repeat x-rays and, and making sure it doesn't move. I think the ones that go straight into a short arm cast or into a, a Velcro splint, I've seen those come back very angulated and, and then it's difficult because they've been told or they think it's a, a you know, a, a hairline fracture that doesn't need much treatment. And then you've kind of got to uh, change their, change the thought process to, to sometimes considering surgical management. And that can be hard for, for somebody to, to come around to. 
demoralizing might be the right word, but it, but it's, you know, it's an, it's an upsetting uh, change for them. So obviously we want to try and prevent that. It sometimes just happens, but preventing that. Now, I don't know that every single person needs a sugar tongue, but um, you know, if you think of it's a low energy and it's a true hairline, a stable fracture pattern, I think it is okay to go straight into a short arm cast, uh, potentially if there's no significant swelling and or a uh, volar resting splint with a, with an ACE wrap, educating the patient to really lay off of it and get repeat x-rays in a week and make sure that, that there's been no displacement. The buckle fractures for kids, that's a bit different. I think that, you know, that would be kind of the equivalent of the non-displaced fracture in an older person. I've been burned on these too. I mean, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a buckle. Yeah, sure. You put it in a short arm cast, they come back and they've, they've significantly angulated through, through, through a buckle. The ones that are a little bit more metaphyseal um, and certainly in an older, in an older age kid, I, I sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll even put these in a, in a long arm um, and put a little mold on there um, to prevent it from moving because they angulate and, and it's frustrating. And then you, and then I, I as a pit in my stomach and I, and I feel terrible about a child with a, a very m- minimal injury that has, that has turned into kind of a, a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk more about surgical radius fractures. What are some parameters or guidelines that you look at on an x-ray to help determine if the fracture needs reduction? The radial height, angulate, dorsal angulation, or volar angulation, and inclination are going to be, you know, our standard guidelines. Mm-hmm. Also assess for intraarticular involvement and articular step off. Uh, any significant articular step off, you know, more than two millimeters is going to be likely a operative indication. But distinguishing between extraarticular and intraarticular are going to, you know, guide guide your ability to get a good reduction. Sure. Radial height, um, when you just, you know, first look at that. PA or AP and uh, radiograph. And, you know, if they're significantly shortened, it's an automatic, um, you know, this is, this is a, this has really been an impacted fracture and uh, there's going to be a problem here. And then you look at the angulation um, and an intraarticular comminution too. Mm-hmm. I think if it's a clean, simple fracture with dorsal angulation, you have a good chance of getting that radial height and uh, tilt uh, back close to neutral and potentially preventing surgery. And I think it's worth it. And I've certainly seen many fractures like that do very well. Um, and it, and it, I think it is, it is worth the attempt. I think any significant uh, dorsal angulation over about 20 degrees from neutral is really potentially going to impede the patient down the road. Um, now, you know, n- certainly not everybody is the same age and hand dominance and activity level mm-hmm. all play into these decisions when they're sort of borderline injuries. And then you have your, your, you know, sort of obvious, uh, grossly almost fracture dislocation type of the wrist where the carpus is, you know, completely not being supported by the radius and, and subluxated. And there's, you know, intraarticular and dorsal comminution. And then, you know, those, those, you're just not going to be able to hold the reduction. Uh, most likely there's, there's no, there's no bone to support it, even if you do get the carpus back on top of the, of the radius. And so, probably more torturing the patient than anything, unless there's neurovascular compromise, and in which case, obviously, you know, you, you want to straighten that out some. And then the other one that I've seen missed uh, several times um, in urgent care, and, and it, it can be subtle, are the volar ones. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it doesn't look uh, as bad because we're all looking for the dorsal angulation as that's more common, but volar angulation, you can't reduce that, right? You're not going to put pressure right on the median nerve to, to hold that hold that fracture back up. And and those those really unless they're completely non-displaced, really don't do well and, and really need surgery. So not, it's not worth a, not worth a reduction um, in my mind. Absolutely. And assuming it does need reduction, how do you approach this in clinic? So for, for the distal radius that looks like it will do, uh, do well and benefit from a closed reduction, potentially saving the patient from needing surgery, a good hematoma block, be patient, let it set up, and then put the patient in, in the in traction um, and let the weights uh, sit on that arm. And, and again, be patient. Let the traction do the work for you. Tugging and pulling on the patient is very hard against when they're tense and, and in pain. Um, and so if they can relax, let everything kind of stretch out and get that height back, then a gentle and stable translation volarly is, is, is most likely going to get a very nice reduction without a whole lot of trauma to the patient. Tell them that their fingers are going to hurt more than their wrist because they will. Uh, the traction really hurts the fingers and, and that that's okay. And then I put them uh, always into a sugar tongue, obviously. I have seen sometimes from the ER, almost like a 
like a clamshell. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that that it's, it's hard to get a three point mold with that. So you really have to go around around the elbow. I don't put these into a cast. I mean, if it's a kid and, and you're talking about a both bone forearm, sure, that can go into a cast and, and bivalve, but we can't really do that in our situation without sedation. So, so really when you're talking about disradius fractures, I think these need to go into a sugar tong after, um, when they're being reduced. The fracture really needs to be reduced and it needs to go to the OR for surgical management. Do you do a carpal tunnel release on edematous distal radius fractures that you're going to do an ORIF on or even a percutaneous pinning? As part of any evaluation of a distal radius fracture, important to distinguish any signs of acute carpal tunnel as those certainly can occur um, with a distal radius fracture. Uh, particularly a significantly displaced one or one with, with a high energy mechanism. Taking a good history as it relates to carpal tunnel, um, you know, has the patient been diagnosed and are currently having symptoms, evaluate for more mild um, or chronic carpal tunnel symptoms. If you ask, you know, do you have numbness and tingling in your fingers? Sometimes they say no and say, well, I do, but I always do. You certainly don't want them to go from, from having occasional carpal tunnel symptoms to having constant. So I think it's important to assess their median nerve, obviously, as part of your workup, um, but also have a discussion about um, the possibility of a carpal tunnel release at the time of their distal radius, if it's clinically applicable. Um, and, you know, in the urgent care setting, if you're not just not sure, um, you know, it, it can't be wrong to put on a consent form, you know, possible carpal tunnel release um, in the event that there is significant swelling um, or symptoms at the time of surgery. That's all we got, doctor. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I'm looking outside and I see snow on the ground right now, so I'm sure there's going to be some icy situations, which means we're going to be busy. I, I really appreciate you being here and thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Coming up next, fingertip injuries, metacarpal and phalangeal fractures. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast. If this has been helpful, please take a moment to leave a review.